When I was a child growing up in northern Minnesota, my father was constantly telling my brother, my sister, and I to turn off the lights. That's my father, and I'm the... I, it's funny how quickly I look at this photo and I remember receding hairlines start really early. <laughs> but when he was telling us this, to shut off the lights, I knew it was for no other reason than to save money. So when I became a parent and my children were the right age, about the mid-90s, I decided to try an experiment. I never told them that electricity costs money. Instead, I drove them to the nearest coal-fired power plant, and I told them that we extract this coal from the earth, blow it off of mountaintops, and then we truck it over to these factories like this one, and then we burn it to make electricity. And in the process, we emit a lot of toxic gases, fumes, heavy metals. And one of those, kind of the scariest to a lot of people, is mercury. And mercury is a persistent bioaccumulative, and I kind of lost him right there, but then I brought him back <laughs> by saying, I said, it stays in the environment for a very long time, and it gets stronger as it goes up the food chain. And what I mean by that is it gets in the water, the fish eat it, and then we eat the fish, and it can cause brain damage, it can cause damage to our spinal cords, to our kidneys and our liver, and it can cause, it can be passed through the placenta quite easily, and so in other words, mommies with babies still in their tummies can be hurt very badly. Needless to say, my children grew up vegetarians. <laughs> they did their homework in the dark, and they're eco-Nazis. But, <laughs> but anyway, this actually got me thinking quite seriously about what is the value of energy? What is it we're looking for from energy? And it seems sometimes, maybe obvious to, to, to some of us, it didn't occur to me right away, but what we really want from energy is, of course, hot showers and cold beer. We want, we really desire the services that energy gives us, and, and it's a really cool thing, to, and it's a great place to start with energy because it's the place where we're, every unit of energy we don't need or we don't use at the end use, at the cold beer or at the hot shower, we not only save money for my father, but we save three to ten times those savings that we saved at the end use upstream at the power plant. So the emissions are reduced. Well, that's interesting. But what do we do about that? Because don't we, don't we still burn a lot of coal, oil, coal, sorry, coal, oil, and natural gas in this country? Yes, we do. Of all the coal, oil, and natural gas we burn in this country, 75 to 90 percent is wasted. How is it wasted? Well, some of it, of course, is wasted in generation of electricity and distribution and transmission, but most of it is wasted through inefficiency. Inefficiency by design, or, or inefficiency by lack of design. So, what do we do about that? Well, uh, one interesting for the economists in the audience, last year McKinsey did a little study, and they said that if the United States invested $520 billion in efficiency, and for scale, last year the stimulus bill was about $790 billion. But if we invested $520 billion in efficiency, we would actually realize a 23% reduction in energy demand by 2020. 23% reduction in energy demand by 2020. What does that mean? Well, that's equivalent to $1.2 trillion in savings for the economy of the United States. $1.2 trillion is only 10% of the national debt, but this is a very significant amount of money that could be used for something else. <laughs> Trillion, I try to think of that. And by the way, in the process of saving 23% of the end-use energy demand, we would actually avoid the release of 1.1 gigatons of greenhouse gases. Well, what, what is the scope or a scale of 1.1 gigatons of greenhouse gases? Um, it's actually equivalent to completely removing 1,500 megawatt coal-fired power plants from the grid replacing them with renewables. 
And for scope or scale, right now in this country, we have about 615 coal plants, roughly operating at about 550 megawatts on average. So this, this is significant. And what's really interesting about it is that it doesn't matter what you think about Keeling's now famous Mauna Loa readings of CO2 and whether you believe in the anthropogenic effects of climate change, because we now have positive proof of climate change. There actually, there actually is no beauty in the truth that we are causing the destruction of the biosphere of this planet. It just appalls me that we put up with this, that we continue to do this when we have efficiency. But I also know that this is a little bit of a downer. <laughs> so. Um, I'm always reminded of the uh, Welsh novelist and critic, Raymond Williams, who said, to be truly radical is to make hope possible, not despair convincing. So maybe in that spirit, let's look at the typical American home. The typical American home, and this is a Cape Cod home, but um, uses a lot of energy and actually I think about $2,000 is the typical energy bill for all energies in, in an average American home. And it varies, of course, by state and climate, but most of the homes built in this country, 85% were built before the year 2000. And that means that most of them have leaky walls, windows, inefficient furnaces and cooling systems. Not because they were built poorly at the time, but because the codes have evolved now and changed, and we've learned a lot about building science, so we know how to build houses better. But not only do they leak a lot of stuff out the energy, out the walls and the windows and the roofs and so forth, but we also use a lot of energy in the buildings and homes that we live in. And we use that energy for cooking and cleaning and entertaining and cold beer. But it's too bad we don't have a gas gauge on the side of our house to know how we compare it to our neighbors. Somehow to, to determine what, what is the energy efficiency of my home compared to them. Well, we kind of do in this HER scale. The HER scale uh, starts out at the top or the highest end at 130 is a typical existing home. And high scores are bad because a low score, a net zero energy house, would be zero. So where's your house? A code-compliant house is the baseline. You built a house last year, probably meets code, I hope. Um, it, would, it would score 100, baseline. Energy Star, you've heard of that for appliances. It also applies to homes. Is about 15% better than code. Energy Star is getting a little bit better next year, maybe 30% better than code. And then there's this new thing to the United States called the Passive House Standard. It's a German energy design standard. It's very aggressive, and you'd actually score a 15 on this scale, which is 85% better than code without any renewable energy. And so good design and even good retrofit or whole house retrofit or whole building retrofit should be able to get somebody from 50 to 80% better than code scoring a 20 to 50 on this scale. Back to our house. If we took the average house in America and somebody said, oh, I want to be green, I'm going to put a solar panel on the roof. In this example, to offset all of the energy that the average house uses, you'd actually have to buy 104 solar panels. <laughs> they don't fit on the roof, of course, but it would also cost you $125,000 before rebates. It doesn't seem very appropriate. However, if you did efficiency first, and by the way, if it's an existing home you're thinking about, it's really about sealing up the gaps and cracks on the outside walls. It's about infiltration and exfiltration is more important than insulation. This is really significant. And then, if you're building new, of course, orientation matters, super windows matter, shading of those windows is really important. Putting enough insulation, thermal bridging is, is avoided. Um, you can get a pretty darn efficient house before you bring in a mechanical system to heat or cool it. And you put in efficient appliances, maybe a home energy management system. You've got a house that's at least three quarters better than code, 75% better than code easy. And guess what? It would only take 
in this case, I think 26 solar panels. And by the way, these offsets I'm showing with panels is to offset all energy for the house, not just electricity. So these are truly a zero energy home. It would cost about 31,000 before rebates, 13,000 after rebates, and you'd have a zero energy home. It would cost half the price of the other scenario, just throwing up some solar panels to offset a part of your load or all of it. And so finally, the caulk gun is mightier than the solar panel. <laughs> and in this case, maybe even sexier. <laughs> so we're always striving for an energy efficiency. I want to close with just a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I really hope um, you'll think about energy end use in, in your lives and sort of uh, things you might be able to do um, to use energy more efficiently, not conserve energy. By the way, conservation of energy really can't be done. Well, not without compromising the services it gives. When my dad shut out the lights, if we were still doing our homework, we would lose the services of the lights. Therefore, it's conservation. There's money savings, but we're not getting the service. That's not efficiency. Efficiency is by design. But I hope that as you think about energy efficiency, you'll also make the connection to the line that goes from your house to the coal plant. And every unit of energy not needed, not used, designed and implemented more efficiently has a three to 10 times savings upstream. And so I ask you and I leave you with a question. What is the value of clean air, of clean water, of clean soil? What is the value of less cancer, less asthma, less strokes? What is the value of energy efficiency to you? Thank you.